All right, I think we have reached the even number of 50 and people will keep joining in the next uh, few minutes, but why don't we uh, get started again? Um, well, everyone, welcome to the Software Craftsmanship India community. Uh, as most of you already know, we are a not-for-profit organization. Uh, our goal is to connect people with software craftsmanship mindset. Uh, we organize talks, roundtables, workshops to help the community get better at our craft. Um, and so far, we have uh, invited several experts to talk on different subjects uh, on the community. Uh, of course, we are in Cubite. We are founder of founder and sponsor of the community, and we are focused on delivering well-crafted softwares. And now to Dragan. He's based in uh, Berlin. I met him in uh, System Thinking Workshop in Newcrafts Conference and was really impressed by your ideas around psychological safety and co-creation and uh, uh, your systems thinking, your, your know-how on it. Uh, we even created a blog on psychological safety and co-creation. Dragan, thanks a lot. And uh, I think we have to give the credit where credit's due. Um, of course, on the formal side, Dragan is a principal engineer, helps companies evolve their engineering culture, tame, their bottlenecks and maximize the throughput of the value throughput of the value. Uh, today's talk is about async code reviews are choking your company's throughput and we'll be taking questions at the end end of the talk. So uh, thanks a lot, Dragan. We'll, uh, as I said earlier, we'll take the questions towards end uh, end of the talk. So you have the full hour now. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me and I'm really glad to be here with you folks. Uh, I'm sharing my correct screen. Let's try again. Window, Microsoft Teams. Oh. This should be right. You're able to see my slides now. Or... It'll take a few seconds. Yep, we see the we see Teams. Okay, just a sec. Then now you see my slides, right? Yes, we do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good, let's start then. Uh, so yeah, today's uh, topic is async code reviews are choking your company's throughput. It's a bit of a controversial topic, I would say, uh, and I think uh, it triggers a lot of discussion and I think useful discussion about the whole process that um, that I think is um, in majority of cases that we have in our industry. So um, yeah, let's let's dig into it. So yeah, my name is Dragan Stepanovic. I'm based in Berlin and work as a senior principal engineer at Talabot, which is a delivery hero company. And uh, topics that have preoccupied my uh, thinking space when it comes to work, um, I think my whole career have been extreme programming, uh, theory constraints, lean and systems thinking. And these days I'm kind of trying to connect the dots between these topics. And there's a lot of overlap. Um, between those, which is really kind of interesting because um, lots of interesting uh, novelty emerges from that. Uh, I tend to rant also on social networks. Um, I don't know if there are any Italians in the audience, but there's one confession I usually make at the start of my talks is that I put uh, me on pizza. For some reason, it started at one, one point in my career uh, or in my life, and now I cannot get rid of that. So yeah, apologies to anyone. Uh, um, yeah. Oh. So um, the things that I'm going to talk about today, I want to frame them in the just sharing uh, principle. So the idea of just sharing is that I'm not here to tell you what you should do or you shouldn't do, or um, um, in any case to try to um, equivalent or put an equal science between your context and my context in any sense. Everyone needs to um, decide for themselves. Uh, I'm here kind of to share my journey when it comes to the extensive study I did on the async code reviews, which spanned more than two years and more than 40,000 pull requests, and some of the um, insightful um, data that that I collected over the course of the study and the insights, systemic insights that I got from some of these insights. Some of these insights I was expecting to see. I wasn't surprised, but some of those um, surprised me. So I'm here to kind of share my journey with you. Um, so not sure how many of you have um, heard for this quote. Nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. And I wasn't part of the industry in the 80s, but what I got to learn is that 
IBM as a vendor was was huge when it comes to the market share. And folks in the procurement department procuring the equipment um, and, and the servers had a really tough time um, trying to buy anything else uh, in a sense of uh, you you got a lot of questions to answer because everyone went with IBM and uh, why wouldn't be as well. So in which ways are we these kind of snowflakes? Are we snowflakes so um, kind of special, so to say, compared to the others? And uh, what's the thing that is driving us towards not using what everyone else is using? So um, I think it's also a kind of a, a sociological um, phenomenon, so to say, uh, going going with the rest of the crowd. But I think the, the, the there is a safety net in a sense that it kind of minimizes the downside risk, right? So if you make a wrong decision, then you're not the only one who made a wrong decision. 80% of uh, people made the wrong decision. So, you know, it provides some level of comfort. So I think uh, it, it kind of um, is a useful risk mitigation strategy. Um, the reason I'm mentioning this quote and is that when I see the teams, um, most of the teams that I got to work with and I see uh, the way that our industry is, is working in general, um, I get to see also the PR based async code reviews, which remind me of this quote that I mentioned before. And uh, I would say that north of 95%, maybe even 99% of teams, uh, I would um, estimate are using, or I guess, are using this kind of workflow. So I'm pretty sure for at least developers, this is a very familiar workflow. Um, but I'll just go to, to this visual where I try to represent it so we can be also on the same page when it comes to the rest of the talk. So what is a PR based async code review? So um, let's say that we have two developers in a team, uh, Emma and Luca, and there it's a start of a sprint or iteration or whatever, and um, they work individually. So Emma starts working on ticket number one and Luca starts working on ticket number two. And um, Emma, at one point, you know, introduces some changes to the system. Uh, hopefully, writes tests. Hopefully, writes them in a, in a writes them before the production code in a test driven development way. And um, at one point, she figures out, okay, I think I'm done with these um, changes, and I would like to invite my peers to get a review. So the way that we typically go about it is. Um, we open a raise a pull request and then we invite other people from our team to review it. But ticket number one and typical ticket number two are not the only things that are going on. So there are lots of other things, uh, stand ups, refinements, uh, plannings, uh, checking email, Slack, um, reviewing other PRs, etc. So uh, Luca being invited to review a pull request, he's not able to react immediately and also because he's busy with ticket number two. So. Then Emma, um, knowing that um, Luke is not uh, going to be able to respond immediately, she, as uh, every um, good employee, doesn't want to twiddle her thumbs and sit idle. So what she figures is, while well, I'm waiting, let me start working on something else. So what happens is she uh, pulls in ticket number three. And um, other things happen in the meantime. At one point, she remembers, OK, I sent this pull request for Luca to review. He's not responding. Let me remind him again. She does that. Then eventually, Luca at one point uh, comes back, uh, asks for changes in the pull request. Emma, uh, uh, but Emma is now busy. So she's busy with other things going on. She is now not able to react immediately. At one point, she also comes around and is able to integrate the changes, but those changes are not the ones that Luca thought or in the way that he thought. So they go back and forth a couple of times until they converge on the solution that both of them are satisfied with and uh, pull request gets approved and merged. Okay, so this is the async code view um, um, process that or workflow that we'll be talking about. So to give you a bit more of a, of a context of the study that I did and, and why did I do it and what was the reason for it. So I am a big fan of this principle, meet people where they are. So everyone is on their own journey, also individually and also when it comes to teams. Um, but I, when I join teams to kind of advise and coach them on some of the practices that I mentioned before that I'm a fan of, 
I try to figure out where do they currently stand and what are the things that we can find as a next better state from where they are currently. And um, most of the teams that they had a chance to work with are working this way. So um, lots of engineers and engineering managers would like to explore different ways of working, but they're not really sure how do they stand when it comes to data, uh, trying to visualize it in, in data, the current way of working. And that got me into thinking of trying to kind of measure some of these things that we're going to talk about um, today. And uh, I was primarily concerned with the wait time and how much does time passes PRs or work items sitting there idle waiting for someone's attention. Um, and it started as a very light based study and it got I got down this rabbit hole, uh, started exploring it. And as I said, um, ended up with uh, reviewing more than 40,000 now uh, pull requests. And um, the teams that were uh, part of that were the typical product development teams, so no open source um, software whatsoever. And um, the systemic insights that I'm going to share with you today were part of these um, of this data set. Um, so yeah, um, what was I, what was I curious to see when it comes to the uh, to this to this process? So me coming from the XP background, which involves pair and, and mob or ensemble programming um, and lots of synchronous um, collaboration and lots of collaboration in general, I was really interested to see like how much of, of time do we spend waiting for each other in these cases. Plus also I was kind of curious to see the engagement, um, the engagement on the pull request that we see. The reason was me, um, understanding that there is that there might be some systemic effects of the delays that we get to see in the system and if there's one thing that i would like to for you to take um, away today from today's talk is that async equals delays so it's by design embedding delays in the whole process um, that might be something that you want to have but there um, it might not be so that's one thing to want to also have in mind so i was trying kind of curious to understand the, the systemic effects of the delays that we get to see when it comes to the wait time in the process and it comes to the, the engagement. And we'll take now time also to dive into these uh, particular metrics uh, a bit. And I was also curious how to see how do these relate to the sizes of the pull request or the amount of code that has been changed. So engagement. Um, why well, was I curious about the engagement? I kind of uh, mentioned this, so systemic effects of delayed feedback. But there's also one another uh, one other component when it comes to engagement is that the way that we usually provide uh, feedback when it comes to the pull request is it, it it's in a written form. The reason because the other side is not available. So um, written form tends to be like a medium of communication that has way lower throughput. It's also kind of reductionist in a sense. You don't really get to see other people's um, expressions or any nonverbal cues. Um, but I think it's generally expensive to be able to write all of the thoughts that you have and provide it as a as a feedback. So uh, in the written form compared to the to the ver verbal one, and and the the synchronous one. So this is the. The, the some kind of communication that their feedback that they called also high latency, low throughput. So you have a latency in the process and it's also kind of when it comes to the feedback itself, it tends to be a bit constrained or kind of uh, inhibited. So going into fun stuff. Um, so this is a scatter plot and um, on the X axis, you can see the size of the pull request. Uh, it's in the lines of code. And talking about the size of the pull request, some people tend to um, kind of approximate the amount of effort invested to, you know, complexity of, of the work that has been done, which can be, you know, some people like to go for the lines uh, change, some people lines added, some people for number of files change or number of packages, etc. For but for this study that they did, I found that the that the size was a, was a pretty good kind of um, approximation for that. And then on the y axis, you can see the engagement. Now, what do I mean by engagement? So I'm trying to understand how much of um, non trivial uh, comments there are on the uh, on the pull request. Um, 
the study excluded any comments from the bots. So uh, as we have them on, on some platforms. Um, and the the definition of a non-trivial comment uh, is that it's a comment that is not trivial. And the comment that is not trivial, uh, is, it has kind of a um, seemingly silly definition, but it's a comment that has four or less words in it. The reason for that was why did I introduce that one? Why did I want to filter out these trivial comments? Is that there, there were lots of PRs that they get to see, which are plus one, LGTM, looks good to me, um, or thumbs up, which don't, don't provide um, almost any feedback to the other side when it comes to the, to the work itself. And um, so what can we see from this? Scatter plot. So most of the PRs are less than 1,000 lines of code, let's say, and um, they have less than 12 non trivial comments. Um, but that got me thinking uh, because I started thinking about the effect of um, how does how does a relative amount of feedback that we get um, correlate with the with the size of the pull request. Meaning, what happens if we, you know, if we invest, let's say, one week and I, you know, I produce a pull request of 1,000 lines, lines of code, and then I ask for for feedback and I get back two comments. It's not the same as if I invest way less time and I get back kind of two comments. So I was kind of curious just to understand a bit more of what's the what's the re relative um, engagement per size. So in the next scatter plot, you can see the on the y axis now you can see the engagement per size, which is number of non trivial comments um, per 100 lines of code changed. And things here started getting interesting. So um, these these kind of systemic insights that I'm going to talk about, they reflected in every in every uh, data set for the teams that have been doing this in code reviews. So I'm yet to find um, um, a, a team that has been doing this in code reviews that didn't have these uh, systemical uh, pattern reflected in the data. And what we can see from here is that the engagement per size as we increase the size of the pull request tends to go down exponentially. So it means that the, the bigger the pull request, the less the less comments or the less feedback per um, Per hundred lines of code that we have, right? And this was kind of uh, interesting, but it was also kind of expected. Um, and the reason why I think it's important to understand this is that we are using um, code reviews as a way to embed a human judgment in the whole process. So we are able to build the quality in. Now, if the process is constraining you in a way that you are not able or that you are inhibited to provide feedback then you have less ability also to build the quality in because building quality in depends on being able to get the feedback. So as we go up the scale towards the uh, bigger PRs, we get to see that we get less and less engagement per size. And um, you might also have experienced this, but you know, if you get a pull request after uh, one week and someone asks me to, re to review it, uh, a thousand lines of code, you know, it's very painful process. It's very hard to course correct at that time because the thing has already been done. So they, there is either quality or there is no quality in it. Uh, and um, it's also kind of uh, painful to course correct from the reason of author asking author to change a lot of things is going to be emotionally painful for them because they invested so much time and got invested in this solution that they pursued. Uh, so um, it's going to be also very, very difficult to to um, go after it. So um, to kind of um, um, quote that I really love that kind of sum it, sums it up. Never had a huge PR that didn't look good to me. I even made a T-shirt out of it and I you know, wear it on uh, different occasions. Uh, one of those is conferences, uh, but I really love it. And uh, maybe some of you also uh, saw this tweet. Uh, 10 lines of code, 10 issues, 500 lines of code, looks fine. If you resonate with this thumbs up or <laughs> add plus one to the, to the chat, but um, I find it, it elicits uh, a lot of a laugh in the audience because it tends to be very true. So 
another way also to to visualize it is also ran into this uh, into this uh, video and feature. So there are some sewers they're trying to prevent people uh, from going inside. But these are like um, these sewers. I see them as reviewers uh, in cases where they need to review a huge PRs. Right? It's just like it becomes a kind of quality theater, so to say. There is not much you can do. What happens then is that you know we usually get LGTM or approve. And and hope that the next time we'll be able to to fix the lack of quality, but usually that never happens. And then we also get to experience a lot of rework down the down the road because we also introduce a lot of risks in the production uh, system. So you know, bugs, escalations, waking up at 2 a.m. etc. Right. So that was about the engagement. Now go, let's go into the wait time, what it means, and and what was some of the interesting data. Um, so. Again, going back to that visual of async code we use. And if we focus uh, only on ticket number one and we pull it up, the same would be also with ticket number two or ticket number three. In any of these cases, uh, I try to visualize here the um, uh, amount of time of its uh, lead time of the lead time of this ticket where it spends or this code or this PR where it spends being actively worked on, meaning Emma coding or incorporating changes or look at reviewing the pull request, etc. And how much of its lead time it spends in the wait time, which is this gray area, which um, kind of uh, tries to de depict the time where this item is just sitting there in the queue waiting for someone, waiting for Emma to respond or local to respond. OK, so then I started trying to figure out, OK, what is the approximation that I can perhaps use in these cases? to try to measure the wait time and uh, the way that I went about it is that I thought okay I think the typical way that we as developers work is that we code for some time we start working on it um, code and then raise a pull request which is the point in time where we ask people for, for invite for feedback and then um, there is a process of going back and forth as we saw and this thing gets merged at one point so the approximation is that the wait time tends to be this majority of the times being spent in the in the second part. Um, and important thing to note is that this is approximation and this approximation is not as accurate in some cases. And some of those cases is, is, are if I get to see a lot of comments after raising a pull request or I get to see a lot of commits, follow up commits, uh, then that also gets to indicate that the uh, the, the approximation is not as accurate and these things have been kind of accounted for. There are a couple of other approximations, but I won't have uh, time today to go into those. So to give you some um, clue about the results when it comes to the wait time. So this was a data set of uh, 500 merged pull requests, which spanned uh, uh, around six months to push through the system of work. So from the start of the first, first pull request until the last pull request has been merged, the time lapse was uh, close to six months. And for this data set, the quality of wait time in months was close to 28 months, which means that the way that it's calculated, the quality of wait time is calculate the wait time for each of these pull requests and then sum it up uh, as an aggregate, which tends to, to also signal to us how much of a time the things have been stuck in our system. OK, so um, this I find is a really important point to have in mind. Um, and I have this metaphor of a hot and um, cold game. If you played it when you were at least kids, is that one person hides an item and the other person goes look for it. Um, and the first person that has hidden the item they uh, provide feedback and the feedback is hot, hot, warm or cold, depending on how close you are to the item. So imagine that you have two teams and one team is providing feedback after every minute and the other uh, team is providing feedback um, after every second. On which of these two teams would you bet that they would find the item sooner? Right. So I'm, I'm pretty much sure that you'll bet on the, on the latter on the ones that get faster feedback, right? And this is really important because the the wait time and the 
that is represented by the amount of time that things are stuck in our system is delaying this feedback. So it's extending the time to get the feedback, which means that we are learning slow, slower at a slower cadence. And um, that's problematic because all of the experiments that we want to try and try to find a value for our customer is going to take us way, way longer because of the way of working. So to kind of show it also in the data, uh, the, so now on the Y axis, we have wait time in hours and um, X axis is again size. Um, not much to see here, to be honest. So most of the PRs have less than 200 hours of wait time. I would say that it's maybe like 85th percentile of the data or something like that. But that also got me thinking again. Um, and if I let's say that I spend one week um, of of effort um, creating a pull request, making changes to the system uh, without feedback, without getting feedback, and then I ask for a feedback, and then I wait for two days to get the feedback, it's not the same as when I invest ten minutes of time uh, to just change something, and then I have to wait two days for feedback. Right. So the relative cost of of feedback is different in these cases. So then what happens if we normalize the y-axis by the um, uh, size, meaning how much of a wait time per size we get to see. And this was the surprising part for me. And I'll tell you uh, about that a bit later. But what we can see here is that as we reduce the size of the pull request, the wait time per size tends to go exponentially up. And again, this was present in all of the data sets that uh, I've analyzed. Um, and the, the way that I think this is important is that it signals that the cost of code review per size of pull request goes up exponentially as we reduce the size of the pull request, which means that the, the relative cost of code review for smaller PRs is going to be way bigger than for the bigger PRs. And that's also maybe one of the reasons why we go into the bigger pull requests because um, the cost of, of reviewing smaller pull requests is, is huge, right? So that was a surprising part for me because, um, you know, I advocate at least if teams are doing big pull requests, uh, I advocate at least start doing smaller pull requests, halve the size, then halve it again, then halve it again, etc. cetera. Uh, but the, in the teams that have been doing async code reviews, that turned out to be a problem because as we saw it, you know, we tend to face a, a wall on the other side that is pushing back against us because of our relative cost of code review increasing exponentially. But at the same time, we want to have small pull request. And why? So the reason is they take less time to write. Um, they are also quicker to review because they are smaller in size. If you send me a pull request of 1,000 lines of code versus pull request of 10 or 20 lines of code, I can squeeze the second one way um, easier into my calendar and my schedule than trying to allocate one hour for reviewing a pull request of and writing comments, etc., for for a huge pull request. So it's a less time allocation for the reviewer. There's also a higher engagement, as we saw on the smaller pull requests, because people feel that they are able to to um, kind of uh, course correct and um, enable higher quality. Uh, they're also less risky because we change less things at a given uh, time. Uh, they're also easier to troubleshoot because um, there are less things that have changed and then if something goes wrong, we kind of know where to look at. Um, there is also, when it comes to the daughter research and Accelerate, uh, they also contribute um, positively to all of the four metrics um, from the from the Dora, Dora research. So we want to have a small pull request, but you know um, we're kind of incentivized to have bigger pull requests if we're working in an async code views manner. And I want to also give you another ex example that I'm pretty sure most of developers have encountered, where you get to see the same systemic effect. And um, the case or the example is, imagine that you have a, a test suit that takes 20 minutes to run. So if you have a test suit that takes 20 minutes to run, would you run test suit after every line of code change that you make? Well, it's probably not, right? Because it doesn't make any economic sense because most of the time you're going to spend waiting for a feedback from the test, right? So 
what this thing is going to uh, kind of incentivize us is that we are going, the system is kind of telling us, hey, getting feedback from test is super expensive, so use it very wisely. And the incentive is that we introduce more changes um, to the system before uh, running the tests uh, in order to make a sense of the whole economic sense of the whole process, which kind of shifts us back into the bigger pull request. And there's, oh, sorry, the bigger uh, changes, which is a pro problematic per se, because now when you have a failing test, now you have to go through half an hour of changes in order to understand where exactly did you introduce the problem, right? So you can see this, uh, this example all around you um, whenever you, you have this, this is called high transaction cost of a batch uh, coming from lean. And whenever you have a high transaction cost, it incentivizes bigger batches. Um, <clears throat> another way to think about it is also that the transaction cost of a batch, like how, how much does it cost you to transfer a batch of work from one stage to the next one, is also so in increasing the inventory, um, meaning the amount of, of changes that you introduced before um, asking for, for a feedback. And delays are part of the uh, contribute to the transaction cost, as we saw it there, because getting feedback in the async code reviews it gets very expensive with a smaller pull request. So the inventory, the, the system incentive is to increase the inventory, total inventory in the system uh, to make uh, economic sense of the, of the current incentives. Um, and that's also why I love this quote from Don Reinertsen. Um, so while you may ignore economics, it won't ignore you. So be very um, kind of uh, attuned, be attuned to the economic incentives that you have in your system, in your development process. And another really important thing to to kind of reflect on is that if you you know try refactoring this kind of environment, try making small changes and then asking for a feedback. It's it's rarely going to happen. Um, because the cost of code review is expensive for smaller changes. So what happens is that, you know, if I need to wait two hours to rename a method to get the feedback on that or to get this thing approved, and then I'm going to either not going to do it or I'm going to batch it with some other changes uh, when it comes to that. But uh, this is the reason why I find that people, when there's a lower latency in, in the system, lower latency in communication, those teams have um, usually way better all else being being equal way better quality than the the other teams with a high latency in the in the process because it's not as expensive to make small changes and we know that that we want to be able to continuously refactor in order to be able to keep our code base healthy and responsive to change so this is how the process affects the quality of the code base and all now, there's also one thing that, that I reflected on that, that was also interesting is that in some cases, you know, there's this idea of PR nitpicking. So we don't want people to nitpick, uh, like trying to ask for small um, changes in the in, in the PRs. I'm not sure how many of you have encountered that. But uh, what they realized is that, is that PR nitpicking is not really about nitpicking. And um, the kind of um, my my starting point was trying to understand how much um, of, of problem this tends to be uh, pull request nitpicking, and I ran a Google search query, and then I got a gazillion of of articles. How do you handle nitpicky code reviewers? Um, how to nitpicking on code reviews with empathy? Stop nitpicking in code reviews, etc. And uh, that was really funny because I think it's. Um, the, the thing with the peer nitpicking is that when you get the same two people that have been working in async code reviews and have this uh, inherent latency there with a higher cost of which signals a higher cost of code review and you get them to pair or work together, uh, the same comments that they had on the pull request are not perceived as nitpicks when they work together. Why? Because the cost of, of integrating the feedback is very low. I have only one line of code of change to lose, right? If I, I, you know, you might say, hey, there's a there's a typo in the name of your method. You know, as I as I as I name it, I immediately am able to do that. So the cost of integrating changes is very low. So 
what they notice is that the, the, the kind of whole problem of nitpicking dissolves by reducing the latency in the whole process. Okay. So uh, me coming from also systems thinking and uh, this is also going to be um, kind of um, interesting part because um, the, the, the things that we draw here are also um, are called uh, causal loop diagrams. So those are diagrams uh, from the systems thinking toolbox. And I'll give you a very short crash course on those uh, before we try to understand what they try to uh, draw here. Um, but the reasoning for me to to kind of visualize it is I was trying to make sense of of uh, why the teams that are doing uh, trying to do small pull requests in async code reviews environment are not able to achieve it or sustain it. Um, so uh, causal loop diagrams are kind of simple. Um, they have a couple of um, components. So one thing is these labels that you see, for example, PR size and motivation or incentive to review. And they can be connected in two ways. So either they are connected with a um, causal um, kind of link that indicates that both of them go in the same direction, meaning if, if two variables are connected with uh, plus, I mark uh, call it here also as a blue to be easier, easier to distinguish. Um, if there's a plus between two variables, that means that both of them go in the same direction. For example, if number of PRs to review goes up, the number of interruptions per reviewers also go up and they go also um, in, in, in opposite together. And there, if there's minus, it means that they go in opposite directions. So if PR size goes up, the motivation or incentive to review goes down and vice versa, right? So what, what's interesting about the causal loop diagrams, once you map out the things connect the dots, you might discover there are some um, feedback loops uh, in there and there are two types of feedback loops so one is the reinforcing feedback loop and the other one is the balancing feedback loop and the reinforcing feedback loop is a typical snowball effect the more of something you have the more of it you'll have while the balancing feedback loop is a is a feedback loop that seeks the goal seeks a goal so um you know if it's um uh, we are at home and it's we have a thermostat that is set at 21 degrees the system is going to work until until it matches this uh, this uh, temperature and then it's going to stop if you open the door and it's cold outside it's going to work even harder to achieve this goal but when it when it achieves the goal it stops so let's uh, let's walk uh, walk through the causal loop diagram here and uh, again the idea is why the teams that are doing async code reviews are not able to achieve or sustain the small pull requests and to reduce the, the size of the pull request. So if we start from the pull request size, let's say that we halve it uh, or we reduce it at least. Uh, so what happens to the motivation or incentive to review? It goes up, right? Because we reviewers favor smaller pull requests to review than bigger pull requests, right? So if, when the motivation or incentive to review goes uh, down, time waiting for a review from author's perspective, also goes down and as that goes down uh, the perceived cost of code review from the author's perspective also goes down and if this cost of code review goes down it also incentivizes us to continue reducing the kind of have smaller uh, pull requests okay so this is a reinforcing feedback loop that you uh, can see here and that's a, a good thing to have that's the desirable feedback loop that you want to have but unfortunately this is not the only thing that is going on in the system uh, why? Because if we reduce the size of the pull request uh, in, in the async code reviews teams, then the number of PRs to review in a given uh, amount of time uh, goes up. So if, um, you know, if we had one pull request in one week and then you halve it, we're going to have two pull requests. Right? And if every team member is doing that, then you multiply that by the team, team members and you get to see how, many, how much the, the number of PRs to review in a given amount of time also increases. And as the number of, number of PRs to review goes up, the number of interruptions also for reviewers goes up. Uh, which kind of, you know, everyone trying to protect their own personal flow that also kind of reduces the high number of interruptions, reduces the motivation or incentive to review. So we kind of push back against that. And um, that kind of uh, increases the time waiting for a review relative in relative terms again. 
which means that the perceived cost to code view goes up and it um, the kind of the system pushes back against us and uh, tries to um, incentivize us to increase the size of the pull request. So that's a balancing feedback loop that you can see here. So it's balancing this reinforcing behavior that you want to have. It's kind of going against that. And uh, there's a conflict here, as you can see. So the motivation incentive to review is kind of affected in two ways from in, um, opposing ways from uh, two sides. And unfortunately, this is not the only balancing loop that is happening here or some or behavior that is pushing against us. One more thing that is happening is that, as you saw it also with Emma in the individual, as time waiting for review goes up, we have higher temptation to start working on something else. What this means is that we're going to draw in even more pull requests into the system, which means that the number of pull requests to review goes even more up. Okay. So, um, switching gears into the flow efficiency and why why it's important. So, flow efficiency is the metric coming from Lean, and uh, the idea is that you look at the cycle time or the lead time of the item uh, from start to finish, and then you try to um, figure out how much of a time, percentual wise, did we spend actively working on it. So, the lower the flow efficiency, the worse the process and vice versa. So we want to have a higher flow efficiency. And um, um, I try to kind of also calculate that and depict it. So on the y-axis, you can see something that says average flow efficiency in percentage for peers up to size, but uh, try to simplify it as a flow efficiency only. Uh, not going to have not too much time to go into that, what exactly this means, but the the kind of curve that you get to see here when it comes to trying to represent the flow efficiency is really interesting. And it's uh, as you can see here, it starts plummeting at around 120 lines of code. And the problem with that is that if you imagine that, uh, so the flow efficiency plummets uh, as you start decreasing the size of the pull request, which means that our process becomes worse and worse. And if I ask you to have a um, thought experiment and and let's say that you want to push the kind of lines of code change through our system of work, and let's say that we can do it in two ways, at least two ways. So one way is having 15 PRs of 20 lines of code, and the other one is just having one PR bundling it up of 300 lines of code and sending that for review. So the thing that this curve tells us is that the cumulative lead time that is going to take us to push 15 PRs of 20 lines of code is going to be way longer than the cumulative lead time of one PR of 300 lines of code. Right? Um, and that's something that we can also see here in the wait time per size, which means that the throughput on the smaller um, smaller size of the PRs of the spectrum um, goes down because the flow efficiency also goes down because the lead times um, go up. Um, and um, that's one of the reasons that that the thing that um, the, the teams that are trying to do async code reviews are kind of stuck between their hard place and the and the um, the rock of trying to balance between the, the throughput and the quality in a sense. Another way also to, to understand it is that as you reduce the size of the pull request, so the processing time per size or how much time do we need to invest in, uh, for smaller PRs is usually uh, going down linearly or um, stays the same, doesn't matter. But what happen, happens is what we saw is that the wait time per size goes up exponentially and then when you think about the wait time to processing time uh, ratio, it goes up exponentially, which means that the flow efficiency goes down and the throughput goes down. And the reason for that is that another way to think about it is that the wait time per size goes up exponentially as we reduce the size of the pull request in the async code reviews is that with smaller pull requests, you are becoming, um, you're kind of inviting uh, dependency to others sooner. Right. When I work on on a pull request alone, I'm not dependent on anyone. But when I need to a uh, review, I'm dependent on someone. So if you reduce the size of the pull request, it means that you're inviting dependencies sooner and more often. And dependencies in the async code review teams are super expensive. That's the reason why it also reflects in these costs. As I mentioned, async equals delays. That's one thing to have in mind. Um, another way also to, to, 
to understand the second order effect of, of uh, working async is that what we're doing to the system of work with async is we are reducing the cost of starting new work to zero because if I'm dependent on someone else, I mean, I need a reviewer in the process and they are not available. If I go async, I can start working on this thing, right? And what happens because of that is that the arrival rate, the number of things that we pull into the system goes up. And we also saw it again with Emma, while she was waiting for feedback from Luca, she started working on something else. And there's a problem with that. And the problem with that is that the working process in the system, again, this is coming from Lean, Kewing's theory and Little's law, is as you increase the working process, the amount of things that you're working on at the same time that are falling through your system, the throughput goes down and the lead times uh, go up. Okay, which means that the things are stuck for longer time in your system. And um, so there's kind of a reinforcing feedback loop, right? Uh, as as working process increases, the responsiveness in the system um, decreases, which means that the wait times goes up and that increases the temptation to start working on something else, which increases working process even more, and we go round and round. So this is kind of undesirable um, reinforcing feedback loop. Um, oh, I didn't, uh, this is some slide that I, that I uh, forgot to mark as hidden, but one thing that I think is really important is that when we talk about estimates, right, uh, so many times and the accuracy of those, uh, which is very low. And the problem with that is that if you're trying to op, uh, kind of estimates in a fully loaded system, um, fully loaded meaning high working process, most of the time your items are spending in the wait time, but you're trying to estimate the processing time, the effective work that the, the time that is going to take. So what's interesting here is that if your lead time is dominated by the wait time, then what's um, kind of what makes more sense is to estimate the amount of time that, that your items are going to wait, which is very hard to do, of course, but that's the thing that makes more sense than trying to estimate the effort, right? Um, Another thing is also that the speculative inventory in the system increases with delays. Um, the thing that is kind of important here is that um, I'll give you an example, but uh, let's say that you want to order something from, from your favorite online store and it takes them, let's say, three days to deliver and you want to buy a jacket. So if you want to buy a jacket and there are a couple of things, couple of ones that you would like to try, you're not really sure which one you want. If it takes them three or four days to deliver, you're not going to order one by one. Like there is one that I'm going to order and then after three days, I'm going to get it. I'm going to try it. If it doesn't fit, then I'm going to return it back, order a new one, etc. No. So what we're going to do is going to batch uh, all of these jackets, uh, order all of them uh, or I mean, uh, most probably. And um, when we get them, we try all of them, figure out which one we want, and then we return back the ones that we don't want. So what happens here is that we, uh, the amount of speculative inventory, the amount of uh, number of jackets that we're not going to, to take increases, right? Because we're taking only one of those. And the problem with that, that, that problem is caused by the long delays in the system that you have. So you get this speculative inventory that is flowing through the system that you don't even know if you're going to need it or not, right? So now your clothing store, they also need to order this from their partners, pull their inventory. They also have to have it on, on their uh, in the stock. So you have increased also the inventory in your par uh, partners, warehouses, etc. And all of this for the reasons of the speculative inventory flowing through the system, uh, while most of it is going to be kind of discarded or not, not uh, taken. So that's one way to also think about it. Um, another thing uh, I see we're also kind of uh, getting close to the end, so I'm, I'm going to uh, speed up a bit. But um, one thing that is kind of interesting is also that uh, I noticed a lot of, so to say, this um, asking for a review, repeated ask for a review, please, and uh, praying hands, etc. So lots of different ways that people uh, repeatedly ask for for uh, for uh, PRs to get reviewed. And what you notice is that the amount of begging in the system is proportional to the working process. 
which is kind of interesting, funny way also, uh, it's a kind of a side effect or, or a product of the system, is that the more things that you, that you juggle at the same time, the more time they're going to wait, so you're going to have more of these repeated asks for those. Um, so, yeah, if you get to see a lot of begging in the, so to say, in the, in the themes, try thinking about reducing the latency between the people and reducing the working process. There's even a person on Twitter uh, that uh, said that they even have, have a term for that, which they call it merge begging, anyway, if you need it at any point. Okay, so um, we said we are not able to build in quality with bigger PRs, and we also lose throughput on smaller PRs um, if we are working in the async code review manner, which means we're trying to kind of balance between these two. Do we lose throughput or we lose quality? And we try to kind of find a sweet spot. And um, anyone who has had a chance to see a Don Reinitzer's work, there is a, a curve called batch size optimization U curve. And uh, you can also um, kind of see it there represented is the same thing. So you're trying to find the optimal batch size depending on uh, various forces that you have in the, in the, in the system. And um, those are kind of holding costs and the transaction costs. Anyone, uh, anyway, for anyone that is interested in this, they can dive deeper into that. So um, uh, this quote, there's always a, a trade-off. Uh, I think it's it's really important to evaluate. And me growing as a as an engineer, uh, progressing through my career, I got to use it a lot. There's always a trade-off, and it depends. That's another one, um, right? But what I realized along the way is that there are some trade-offs that actually do not exist, because the underlying assumption is flawed. So you have to really be sure of the assumption that you have below the trade-offs that you're claiming that there are in order to be sure that that you're not um, claiming there's a trade-off for the things that uh, the reason actually and um, one really important point or kind of lesson that was uh, communicated in the accelerate book uh, and the dota research is that the, the debunking this myth of throughput versus stability so instead of either throughput or stability, you actually get both of them or neither of them. So either you have both throughput and stability or none of those, okay? And uh, that's kind of a segue into the, the last part of the talk. Um, and I'll try to show that I think there's a way to have our cake and, and eat it too. Um, and if we try to uh, work through the problem backwards, I think we might get to some clues. So we said as we reduce the size of the pull request, cost of code review per size goes up, and uh, which also affects the throughput, right? So if we try to work backwards from there, and what do we need to do if we want to reduce the size of the pull request? Because we want to have smaller pull requests, but not lose throughput. So in order to do that, the cost of code review per size as we reduce the size of the pull request needs to stay constant or minimal. Which means in order to do that, the actors reaction time, well, by actors, I mean authors and reviewers, they need to re react exponentially faster and faster and faster to the requests from the other side in order to be able not to um, increase the cost of the code review as we reduce the size of the pull request. And in order to do that, their availability in the system needs to go up. Remember, Emma and Luca, they would like to. Um, uh, kind of respond immediately, but they're busy with a gazillion of other things at the same time, right? So we need to have a higher availability of the actors in order to not um, lose the throughput while reducing the size of the pull request. Um, if we pull up only ticket number one here, and let's say that M and Luca uh, have this average size of the pull request, and this is like in on a timeline, uh, ticket number one. So what we're saying is that as we reduce the size of the pull request, they need to react faster and faster and faster until at one point where you get to the to, um, to uh, very low size of the pull request, which in order not to lose the throughput at that part of the spectrum, they would need to react instantly. Okay, which was also a conclusion of the study, which says that in order not to exponentially lose the throughput while reducing the average size of a PR, people need to get exponentially closer and closer and closer in time. So that leads us to a continuous code review. Okay. Um, I'll skip this one just because of the time. 
So you remember that there was there was this uh, incentive to review conflict here that we had, right? Uh, which was caused by the number of interruptions, because the higher number of interruptions, the less motivation or incentive to review. But one thing to have in mind is that you cannot get interrupted if you're working on the same thing as the person trying to interrupt you. So you're working on the same thing, right? So um, that's kind of a segue into this parallel universe, which are called the uh, co-creation patterns. So um, pair and mob programming, and hope you at least had a chance to hear about those, if not practice it. Um, and one interesting thing also to understand is that when there's incidentals in production, we also work in the same way. So we get on a call, we don't go async, we don't send emails, letters to each other. We jump on a call to reduce the lead time, meaning reducing mean time to detect and to recover, right? So, and these same actually lessons can be applied to, um, to our business as usual work in order to be able to reduce the, the lead time. So working together tends to help with that. And what happens is a byproduct of working together is that you have guaranteed availability of the reviewer, right? And what this means is that, uh, is that the optimal batch size can shift all the way to the left without losing throughput because the transaction cost uh, becomes minimal because I have inst ability to get the instant code review immediately. Okay. And um, so how would, I was thinking, how would this catapult look like had we done a continuous code review? So these line, this line, this effective size of the batch would be minimal because we have a review immediately for every almost every line of code that we type. And the wait time per size also goes down to zero because the, the, the review is guaranteed as a byproduct of the process, uh, like uh, as availability. Engagement per size, I, I'm not sure, but what I usually notice when there's a lower latency in the process that the engagement also tends to go up. So um, then I started thinking, so what are the things that you try to optimize here for? We want size to go down, we want wait time per size to go down, and we don't want to lose engagement because it's a precondition for being able to lose the, uh, to build the quality, right? By the way, I'm not saying that if you have a lot of engagement that it needs, that it um, means that you have quality, right? It really depends on the type of the, of the comments and the feedback. But if you don't have engagement, that, that definitely means you're not able to build the quality. So um, you might have noticed um, this score uh, on, on, a, on a sidebar, and this is kind of a formula that I used to try to um, model the, the dependencies or the relationship between these things that we try to optimize for. So this PR score is size times wait time in minutes divided by one plus engagement. One plus engagement because some PRs don't have any engagement and you don't want to divide by zero, of course. So what happens um, when you have continuous code reviews as a byproduct of uh, co-creation is that the size of the pull request is as minimal, can be as minimal as one line of code change. The wait time in minutes is zero and engagement kind of doesn't matter because this whole thing evaluates to zero. And this is actually the best result that you can get if you optimize for, for these metrics, right? And so that's also one of the reasons why I say that the optimal size of a pull request is the smallest atomic change that is reviewed as it's being typed. And I honestly don't know for a better way to achieve it than uh, pair and more programming. So maybe we discover also along the way uh, some other techniques, but I think these ones provide this as a um, kind of bonus side effect of it. Um, so this is a timeline for uh, kind of for I think 500 pull requests that you can see here and the Y axis you can see score and it was on the log um, log um, scale because the results were so high meaning so bad that they had to put the log scale and this is one world that they get to see okay? and then there's the other one that uh, that they get to see with continuous code reviews so there's a huge gap between these universes so to say when it comes to um, to these things, uh, throughput and the quality. Um, I'll skip this one just for the sake of the time. And um, throughput or quality, I say throughput and quality. I think we can achieve both. Um, and um, 
I'd like also to call to close it with we've been told all along that we'll achieve more if we limit and delay our interactions as humans. But I hope that you now also have a deep informed reason not to kind of not to believe so. Uh, I also wrote a, a article for InfoQ that, that gained a lot of attention uh, on this one, where I'll touch on, uh, on this topic, also on some other topics when it comes to co-creation. So if you're interested, um, I invite you to read through it. And uh, having said that, I would like to thank you for uh, for the attention. And I'm also realizing we are also a bit over time. Sorry for that. If you have any questions, we can dive into those. Thanks a lot, Thanks, Greg. Greg. I, uh, I uh, was making a list of different questions, and uh, I think you have done this presentation uh, most probably in front of tough audience because whatever questions I had, I had to scratch them off as soon as we started moving. Uh, all the questions were answered, especially about quality and, and delays. Uh, at some point of time, it also felt like the delays increase the batch size and batch size increase the delay. So that in itself is also uh, sort of a reinforcing loop. Um, now, I remember long time back, I, I had read in a book how about like how uh, pairing impacts time. So for instance, uh, if two people were working together as, as pairing, uh, were pairing, they do the the work 60% faster. So mm -hmm. if it would have taken them 10 hours, they would do it in six hours. Uh, but per person, they're using six, six hours. So they're actually uh, taking 20% more person hours. So in 20% more percent hour, you do 40% faster. Um, Right. Uh, so is there anything that you found that if uh, and I know that you've been working uh, where you may have brought these changes uh, as a cultural change in companies where uh, you stop doing or at least uh, decrease the number of PRs and uh, started pairing. So is there like a time study between how, whether you save time or you lose time as as person hour as well as time to market? Yeah, so uh, the thing is that, uh, so again, me coming from lean and theory of constraints, uh, I honestly don't focus focus on utilization, on how much people are working in a sense, or you know what the amount of time they spend. What I'm looking at is the throughput of the system, meaning how the lead time of uh, the items, how long does it take us to get these things to our customers. If this thing is, is reduced and we have higher throughput of that, then that's the thing that we optimize for because we are looking for accelerating the learning cadence, which kind of leads to accelerating or maximizing the throughput of the value, right? So we don't focus on keeping everyone busy or or uh, in, um, kind of um, measuring that part, but if on increasing the throughput of the value and shortening the lead times. So. Um, that was one of that was kind of the reason why I didn't go down this path. And uh, but what I noticed anecdotally from the work is that people do like it doesn't only working together doesn't only affect or reduce the wait time, it also reduces the processing time. Uh, and that's something that they usually kind of um, point out to the teams when they start working together. Something that they didn't didn't even notice is that you know when you're able to course correct sooner then you cut out the wrong path sooner, which means that you know whoever uh, in the mob or the pair session knows the things, how can we do these things faster, then all of us benefit from that. So the processing time also kind of goes down. Um, so I would say that kind of matches, so of, well, that, that's just um, anecdotal experience, but I would say matches kind of the results of that, yeah. Or the study. Okay, and uh, I think I I have to drop off for another call, but I just had one more comment that I wanted to make, Dragon. Um, uh, that this I, I wonder if you have read the new paper on DevX. It's uh, some of the same authors from the Accelerate book and Abinoda, Nicole Forgress, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that paper actually Please. talked about. Uh, this is space, not after space. They came up with DevX, which mm -hmm. is just in 2022 or 23. Uh, space has S P A C E, like five S P A C, five measures. Yeah, and DevX has three, 
and those three were i think cognitive load feedback loop and flow state yeah. uh so pr not only is scaling the productivity but everything that has to do with devx it's also kind of impacting negatively right so your feedback loop gets slower your cognitive load gets worse and your flow state because you are changing from one to the other so yes definitely the the the, amount, the higher working process increases the the kind of uh, cognitive load and I think that's really one important segment that I think has been explored as part of team topologies. All the team topologies is really looking into cognitive load, but the way of working, I think, can be really interesting connection with the team topologies efforts to kind of uh, optimize for lower cognitive load. Yeah. Right, right. Well, cool. I think Sia here can take over. Sia, I, th I think I uh, think if you could moderate, I, I see Akshay has a question and you yourself has a question as well. Uh, and then uh, we can uh, hang up. Uh, Dragon, I'm so sorry. I had a conference call that I need to uh, attend. Yes. Yeah, I uh, have all. Thanks a lot, okay. everyone. Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dragon. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Sapan. Hey, Dragon. So. I think one of the questions posted in the chat by Akshay is that let's say we are doing pair programming, but mm -hmm. uh, one person in the pair does not possess enough knowledge to do the review and uh, they are pairing just so that they can make the less experienced person upscale. So in that, uh, Akshay, if I'm understanding correct, your question is that we would still need a third person to review it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. So, like uh, the the mobile and sample programming, the way that they that they see it in terms of the skill, you get all of the skills needed in order to get this thing from start to end to production, right? So, if if you're going to need a new reviewer instead of relying async on them, get them in the in the session so you work together. Uh, that's kind of the idea. Often, it happens that these people are um, seeked a lot or kind of um, are a bottleneck in the system. But the thing is, um, you want to make them a delivery bottleneck in order for them to spread the knowledge as soon as possible so you can accelerate the rest of the team. That's kind of the idea. Akshay, do you have any follow-up questions? Uh, there was another which kind of were, was answered in the chat, but I'll still repeat if you have uh, uh, something else. So what if something has to be reviewed by some exit person or persons or you know some set of people who can check from higher level design uh, level or some different perspective. If there is these type of set of rules, what what should we do? Yeah, so either we get them in the session together with us or they need to kind of have higher availability in order to respond quicker when we need them. So that's kind of the idea. We don't want to wait for others, right? If we're waiting for others, that usually indicates that there are too many things that we're working on at the same time. So we need to reuse that in order to kind of accelerate the flow through the systems. So we have faster reaction times and then we get to shorter lead times at the end. OK, thank you. Cool. OK, then. Um, I have a couple of minutes left. I don't know if there are any other questions. Yeah, uh, uh, so I uh, go through your charts data and uh, my question is that are those old PRs uh, have any kind of pre commit or automated linters for those uh, data is pure uh, human-based PR. So I believe that if we will use some kind of automated linters or pre-commits, then the data can be a different. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I am asking that uh, you saw some data, a statistic of PR and score that how much time it is taking. So on those old PRs, are you running any kind of linters or any kind of automated uh, code review systems? Uh, no, so these are the PRs that, that are, I mean, this part is about the human part of the review. 
sense of uh, the, I mean, they might have some linters or whatever that they have as pre-commit hooks or so, but these things might be like running before um, the um, releasing a pull request or shooting getting the commits. So yeah. I'm not sure if I'm asking the question, but yeah. The thing is that uh, if we implement a way like uh, for linting, so in most of the PRs that go to and fro is happen because of the, some kind of uh, linting issues, some kind of code styling issues mm -hmm. that we can now automate using the actions or CI/CD. Yeah, I think it depends on what are using code reviews for. I think there is part that is automatable, but lots of that is not like human judgment. So that's the part that I'm mostly focused on. So uh, my question is that uh, all the statistics you saw, those are all related to human judgment, or it's yeah. still including the coding style and other things, because all those things can be yeah. uh, automated. And in that time, it can be a uh, zero minutes of review, because once the developer will post within a two or three minutes, we will get that review. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, so. I, I to, the answer is I don't know. Uh, I didn't look through all, like each of these four four forty thousand pull requests. Um, but uh, I think the the kind of uh, the idea still holds in a sense of even if you were to automate this, there's a human judgment that we're waiting for, say async again. Uh, that's kind of the thingy. Um, even even if someone you know just needs to approve the pull request or clicks LGTM or whatever is the case, there's still async that is involved in there. Uh, so it also depends when it happens. Um, so yeah, that's kind of um, the way that I think about it. Yeah. So why I'm asking is so in our case uh, we are running lots of kind of linters uh, in uh, JavaScript, Go, PHP. We have linters. Even we are running the unit test cases in our CI, right? So if those are not passing, then uh, human will not uh, review that yet. So first check is even at that that if developer is uh, creating a PR, it should pass all the automated check cases. Then uh, human will review. Yeah. So I want to see that if that data is applied to here, then it can reduce how much thing of it is still there. We are still there or not. So again, I think so this this thing I see it is orthogonal to this whole story in a sense that uh, I think it's beneficial to do these things to automate uh, as much as possible, especially code style and stuff like that. But, you know, did you name a method right? Is, should this method be in this class or not? Should it be some other responsibility? Are we pulling in dependencies in the particular class that we shouldn't pull, etc.? So all of these things are related to, you know, human judgment. So much of it cannot be automated. So uh, yeah. I think, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be automation, but that these two things um, kind of um, are kind of orthogonal to each other. So yeah, that's kind of. Um, in, oh, I want to say that if you have PRs and async code reviews, you in, even if you automate a bunch of these code styling stuff, if you're relying on human judgment for design or um, these kind of questions, then you still get into the same trouble. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone then. Thanks for attending today.